Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Hi, I'm Joe Mishka. Welcome to another episode of Rural Heritage. Last week we showed you some of the Teamsters and demonstrations going on at the 2021 American Brabant Association Rendezvous held in Medford, Wisconsin last October. This week we're going to listen in on a presentation by ABA President Jason Julian as he tells the origin story of the breed, what they see as their long-term goals, and how they plan to accomplish them. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the 2021 American Rabbana Association Fall Rendezvous get-together. I would be hesitant to say it's a show in any way. Yesterday morning we had a confirmation halter class. The board was talking about it, and it's much more a confirmation class, trying to educate people. That's what I'm going to try to do this morning a little more. Um, so my name is Jason Julian. A lot of you know me already. Um, Longtime ABA board member and the current president. So anyways, I always wanted to drive horses, always wanted drafts. We had a dairy farm. And then we didn't have a dairy farm, we had a hobby farm, and we had riding horses, and Dad was a much older father and a southern father, and we didn't have no time for drafts, and we rode horses, and we bred quarter horses and that. Um, so I thought one day, I, some hames were given to me and a collar, I'm sure nothing fit. We looked at the old pictures and it didn't fit, and I drove my quarter horse, he's a Peter McHugh bred quarter horse, Appaloosa, and it was a joke. And we had another horse named Tubbs, he tried to kill me a lot, because I didn't know what I was doing, he was kind of bad and uh, drove him some too but I lived through it because I could run then believe it or not and uh, we got pictures of that skid and pulp in that red pine plantation when they were thinning it so that's my background and we went to River, River Falls and I met my wife Katrina from Minnesota a long time ago when we were kids and uh, we started farming and farming took over and we listened to what we learned in the university and we got bigger and bigger and bigger and milked more cows and milked three times a day and didn't have any time and my horses stood out in pasture for almost 10 years Go roll a round bale out for him. Yep, still alive. Really, really. I can't stress how poor the management was. Catch them every six months and see if their feet, and feet need to be trimmed. Maybe ride twice a year. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, I'm almost 30 years old. I'm not doing what I wanted. Still not driving horses. I was always going to get draft horses tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. I was going to you know, do it next week. So I went and talked to a friend of mine. And I said, I know a little bit about horses. I know nothing about draft horses or driving. I need a really worn out, broke Amish horse that might keep me alive. And he said, it was smart of you to say that, and I, I can probably find you something. A few days later, he did, and that was my first draft horse, and it's a long story from there. And she was good. Looking back now, she was just a big farm chunk Belgian. She took care of me a lot, and I didn't know. I liked it. Went good. She was good, so I bought some more. I didn't realize there's, well, now there's five different types of Belgians. At that time, there was four different types of Belgians in the country. And the next ones I bought were not. They were Hitch Belgians, and they tried to kill me quite a few times. And I started thinking, gentle giants, these things are hotter than my riding horses. You can't get past an ag bag, you know, without that plastic flaps. And you best hang on. This ain't right. And I've seen a VH tape. About half of you in here will know a VHS tape. About half of you in here know what a VHS tape is. I was watching this VH tape of this skinny little lady from out east, talk funny named Karen Gruner, and she founded the American Brabant Association in 1999, and uh, she was talking about these European Belgian Brabants, and uh, she coined the term Brabant for this country just to differentiate them from the American Belgian at the time. I don't know if she ever dreamed that someday we'd have our own registry. At that time, we didn't need our own registry. It's almost time to put up a new calendar. Make yours a draft horse calendar featuring a couple dozen photos of draft horses at work, show, and play. 
We've been making these calendars for over 40 years and guarantee your satisfaction. They cost only $16.95 each or two for $30. Shipping charges included. Just call 877-647-2452 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. That's 877-647-2452. A little bit of the history of the American Bourbon Association. It was formed in 1999 by Karen Gruner. She was by no means the first one to import a horse, but she got the organizational part of it going to get all these people together that had these horses that were either imported or percentage horses of the crosses thereof. So from 39, you had the war, another massive narrowing of the gene pool in Europe and die off. And after the war, Europe was starving and hungry, and they were interested in a meat horse. Europe drove into the meat horse ditch. America, after the war, whew, we're making money. Why would you farm with horses, young man? Get yourself a John Deere, get yourself a Farma, maybe even an Alice if you're from Wisconsin. And they drove into the show ring ditch. There was no money left in the farm horse. There was no desire. Well, I'm making so much money wiring or pouring concrete, and I don't want a show. That's not for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull horses. I still want, I got grandpa's old mares, and I want, oh, I found one that's bigger yet. I want to win that pull. I want to beat so-and-so. So after the war, you were left with the hitch people, and you were left with the pullers and a few <laughs> not heads that still thought we could use them and the plain folks, the plain communities, the Amish, the Mennonites. So I'll stop right now and let the five current types of Belgians in America, in our country, come in. The first one coming in is a two-year-old. She's been broke for six months. She's two and a half years old. And she is a good, modern representation of a hitch horse. She's what they want. Look at them legs, folks. When she hits the show ring, the knees will be just about hitting the neck yokes. Look at all that power. Next, we have a farm horse or a puller, whoever comes in next. Come on in. Oh, we have the farm horse. She's named Pat. She's been in the woods with us before. Pat is good. She is about a, I want to say, six-year-old Belgian mare. She has no paper. She's born, owned by a plain community. She's had a couple babies. She's broke a couple horses and trained a couple Amish boys. Keep going on down by the hitch, if you wouldn't mind, Wyatt. Next, we should have a puller if he's here. Okay, okay. So we'll bring Callie in. We'll put her in the middle. She is an American Brabant. And I will explain what that means in a minute. Callie is also two years old. I was not going to bring in a two-year-old hitch horse and a two-year-old 94% European and then bring in a mature American Brabant and say, oh, look how good our horse looks. We're bringing in a two-year-old against a two-year-old against a two-year-old. Pet is not a two-year-old and the puller is not a two-year-old. I'm just saying that up front. Can anybody see any difference between those two two-year-olds yet? I understand genetically they're all Belgian. So their genotype, and we may dispute that here in a few minutes, is all Belgian. But obviously their phenotype is not. How the genes express themselves, who made the decisions for breeding, are not. You can see the difference. We should have a puller coming, and we have our 94% coming. There's Dave Myers, longtime board member. He imported 100% horse to breed more American Brabant. This is a high percentage 94% mare. Two years old, two and a half years old. She's had six months in harness. Mike Jordan from West Virginia drove all night to get here. With a, a typical pulling bread mare, and I'll get into this too. This would be considered a lightweight pulling bread mare. So here's your five types of Belgians. We thought it would be valuable. Can you guys turn them all and face west first? Can we get our profile? We thought it would be valuable for people to just see the difference. We worry sometimes because there's people in Europe now re-importing backwards, trying to clean up their own leg problems. There's several people. We wonder what horses they're importing when they talk to the authorities over here on what's the best horse. Can you guys see the difference? Can you turn them and face south? Look at the feather on the 94%. We'll talk about that in a minute. Look at the amount of feather at two and a half years old. Look at the legs on this two and a half year old. Look at the hock set difference. Look at the muscling on this. Now granted this is a mature horse. How old Mike? Six years, seven years old. Had a couple colts. Pets had a couple colts, farm horse. I know for a fact Pet has pulling bread in her, but she's just a farm horse, no idea how much, and here's your hitch horse. Now, I shouldn't have had Dave lead, you'll see why here in a second. 
But no, I'm not, I'm not picking on Dave. That's how they breed them. Slow, lethargic. In Germany, they're considered a beginner's horse. Everybody goes through training, and they start you with a cold blood, a very cold blood, a beginner's horse. Right there it is, folks. That doesn't mean she can't spook and run away. It just, seems, it just means generally they're very slow and lethargic. Why would you want a slow and lethargic animal when 85 to 95% of the colts you breed every year go to the meat pen? They gain faster. Why are you not worried about the legs? We'll just kill the ones that have a problem. You can line back up when you want. You see the easy walk of this American Brabant? You see the puller? She has a pretty easy walk. Mike's a good trainer, though. I guarantee you slap a collar on her and put some weight behind her. She'll come alive. And here's Pat. She's done it all, seen it all. Just glad to get a day off. And Aaron's got the hitch horse. If I put the buggy whip to Aaron and that horse, you'd see beautiful action, but Aaron would have his hands full. We just won't do that right now. So what is an American Brabant? An American Brabant is a cross between a European Belgian and one of those American Belgians, and that's a cross. Well, what do you mean? Well, what's the difference between the European Belgian and American Belgian? We consider these imported pre-1939. I shouldn't turn my back to the crowd. I apologize. These are imported post-1972. Her father was imported in 2016. So here you go, five different types of Belgians, except this one might not be a Belgian anymore. The American Brabant is not a Brabant. The Brabant is a term Karen Gruner brought over here from there. Why did she pick that term? Because she couldn't say the others. They didn't roll off the tongue like Brabant. So what was the original European horse that made up the Belgian stud book? You had the Flemish horse out by the sea, 17 hands and a ton. You had the Brabanders from the area of Brabant, 16 hands to 16'3", 16 1,600 pounds. And, fun, and interestingly enough, after two world wars, it seemed like them genes made it through the best. There was a lot of area of Brabant left. That term seemed to have stuck a lot. And you had the Ardennes from the forest at Steepland, 14'2 to 15'2", 1,250 pounds. Interesting that steep, rough terrain sported a smaller horse, the coastal sported a bigger horse, and the farmland had a stocky 1,600-pound horse. Well, I said the American Vermont may not be all Belgian anymore. We have accepted over 55 Perchin mares into our registry as brood mares. Why would we do that? Because the CPL, the leg problem, is that serious. We have to take drastic steps. We've been advised this by geneticists. We've been advised this by experts in Europe, long-time breeders. You're not, you're not going to get your leg, your hands around this problem with any way except bringing in different genes. Here's the power up here. Here's the distance from the power. Want to see how much weight you can pick up and hold out? Maybe one 1,000. Don't rip anything in our insurance. <laughs> no, nope, we got to be equal now. You get right to the end of the pipe. That way it's a fair experiment. I know, you're short. Nope, straight line. Nope. Can you take more weight than that, or is that enough? Try to go up a little more. One more time. Can you have kids? You can do it. Is that enough weight? Um, you can try. No, no, is that, is that enough? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, what if we cut six inches off her leg? What if we breed a little shorter horse? Try that. We just made her 16 hands. We just made her 16 hands instead of 17 too. How'd that go? You want to try a little more weight? We just made her 16 hands instead of 17 too. We took six inches off. I even used a tape measure at the drill press, guys. Pretty good for me. We just doubled her weight. That's enough though? I don't have enough increments of weight. You guys get the point? We just made her stronger by getting her closer to her power. Daniel, we're going to start you out right here because you're in the heavies. You're the heavyweight pullers. That's a polite way of calling me fat. No, no, you're in the heavies. I didn't say you were in shape or not. Can you try to hold that out for one 1,000? Okay, we're going to lower that boy up. Oh, wait, you got to start off as a pony. Let's put you back out there with the long legs. How's that one? A little heavier? We can add more weight. Oh, I love tortured relatives. Try to hold it one more thousand when you get out there. Want more weight or not? Is that pretty much getting towards the max? Well, now let's take you down from six whatever. You know, let's take you from 17 two hands 
down to 16 hands. Let's take six inches off your leg. All off the leg, not the body. More, any problem or is that lighter? A little lighter? Heaven forbid you guys ever have to pull against the pony. So let's take six more inches off. Of the leg. Easier yet? Moved the weight closer to you, didn't we? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Now let's talk about changing the confirmation for action in the show ring. Now, if you want to walk six horses in the field plowing, and you want to walk all day, you want a horse with a good walk, correct? Not a slow walk, not a clumsy walk, a good walk. Michael, can you do a comfortable walk down and back? How hard is that, son? How long do you think you could do it? Could you do it eight hours pulling a little red wagon? Probably. Okay, but it's going to rain, and it's cold out, and I want you to jog back to the barn. Just jog nicely. You want you to have the ability to jog. Jog, whatever your natural jog is. Man, you are related to me. <laughs> Could you do that quite a while, son? What about if dad was yelling at you? You do it a little longer yet, right? Okay, jog again. Now I want you to do marching band, like your brother's knees up. Knees up. Come on. Knees up. Come on. Did that bother anybody? It looks equally ridiculous when you chase your horses around the sail barn, trying to make exaggerated motions. Maybe get one more bid. Come back. Knees up. Arms up. How long could you do that? What if I put weight behind you and you have... No, you've got to keep going like that. Come on. How long could you do it? But it sells and it looks flashy. Look at me. we got shiny everything. That's fine. If that's your vision, that's fine. But don't call it the same as a farm horse. It just at least admit it's different. Just a simple experiment to prove. Physics matter. So we have a great board. So here's your board on the rudder. We're trying to steer the ship to our vision. To have that horse we had in the middle. We have breeders. And the breeders are our engines. They are our engines. They're producing our next generation. They're, they're going to steer that ship a lot of what they produce. But if half your breeders are communicating with the board, yeah, yeah, pull ahead, back off a little bit, steer a little bit left and right, and half your breeders are not, that's a problem. If half your breeders are getting their commands from here, or they just can't stop thinking about the next sale, ooh, you see them two sold for 19000 I'm on the phone, I don't care what it looks like. Is it blue? Is it blue? Can I get it broke by the next sale? Europe, panicking. They're panicking they're going to lose their market over here. They're panicking that we're shining light in their little closet. CPL, and their confirmation, I, I just went on CPL, I didn't even get on the confirmation of your, their confirmation has changed drastically too. You're not working your horse, you're not testing it in the same way. You don't test a Cadillac the same as you do a truck. You got Europe, American, Belgium, other breeds, wanting to take some of the few young people that want to work horses. I get that, they got to promote their stuff, but we're in competition with them actually. And you got the next sale, the next sale bar and the next sale of a colt. They're trying to run us to ground. And the board is trying to get us out into open water, the promised land of good, clean, sane, healthy horses. Hi, I'm Joe Mishka of Rural Heritage Magazine. I'm on location of one of the many events we cover that celebrates our rural heritage. If you enjoy our show, check out our magazine, where you'll learn more about the people that blend the past with what works today. You can save almost 20% off the newsstand price by subscribing at ruralheritage.com or chat with us at 877-647-2452. That's toll free, 877-647-2452. Hi, I'm Bob Crager. I'm the author of the book, Historic Barns of Ohio, and I hope you enjoy these amazing barn stories. This story is in Morgan County, which again is in Southeast Ohio, Appalachia where there are very few straight roads. And it's owned by Claire Farnsworth, with whom I had arrangements to meet her and see her barn. And I was doing a tour of Southern and Eastern Ohio, and I stopped and spent the night in Zanesville. And so I drove from there, and it was early on a Sunday morning, just at the break of dawn. And of course, I'm being careful with deers. and. There's no question this was the hardest barn of all of them to find. So I'm driving down a road and my car GPS says, turn right. 
well, it's a dirt road, and I don't want to drive down a dirt road. Come on, you got to be kidding me. So I go again, another quarter mile, another mile, and GPS says, turn right. So, ah, oh, another dirt road. No way, I don't want to do that. So finally, uh, my map quest says, turn right. And guess what? Another dirt road, and a couple miles of it with a steep drop off on the right and barely big enough for a car and a half. And thank goodness there weren't any cars coming in my in the other direction. So I finally made it to the barn. It was way up on top of a hill, farmhouse, 18, 1820, 1830. And first thing Claire said was, oh, congratulations, you made it. I said, oh, yeah, it was, it was a challenge, no question about that. But it goes back to the 1820s and her great-great-grandfather, David Smith, who founded the farm, it's hard to believe you could farm with such uh, huge elevation changes, but uh, he did. Maybe they were sheep farmers, I don't know. And David had kind of a sense of humor. So this story goes back to an 1885 report, which I found in the archives. And it was uh, called the Snake Killer. Well, apparently one of David's neighbors was terrified of snakes. Now. You have to go back to the 1820s in Ohio, and it was a huge forest, and there were all kinds of critters. There were wolves, there were panthers, there were buffalo, there were elk. I mean, it was a wild place, huge, huge forest. In fact, they said that a squirrel, starting in what's eastern Ohio now, could hop from one tree to another and make it all the way to western Ohio without ever touching land. It was chock full of trees and animals and Indians too. Uh, well, in the 1820s, uh, they weren't uh, they weren't causing many of the problems that they did in the 1700s. So David knew of this one particular neighbor that was going to be taking a walk down this trail, and he was terrified of snakes. So David had killed three huge black snakes. Now these aren't poisonous, but they're big and they're kind of scary, especially if you're afraid of snakes, as this guy was. So David planted the snakes one after the other on this little trail, sort of hidden, and he hid behind some, some weeds so he would not be noticed and watched as his neighbor walked down. And when the neighbor came to the first snake, he jumps up in the air and says, oh, and he lands on the second snake. Oh, terrible. So when he sees the third snake, he lets out a huge howl and he runs the opposite direction. So the title of the story that was in the archives was The Snake Killer Leisurely Strolled Away. <laughs> and anyway, so I call that the snake killer. And it shows that even though farming in the 1820s was very, very difficult, uh, there was always a chance for a little humor here and there. And so that is the story of the early barn in Morgan County. The rural American countryside is still filled with historic old barns built a century or more ago, but they won't be standing forever. To commemorate and capture the images and stories of the old barns, Ohio native Bob Kruger began painting and writing their histories, and that's all come together in a new book called Historic Barns of Ohio. You can get your copy by calling 877-647-2452 or visiting ruralheritage.com. It costs just $23.99 plus $7 shipping. Call 877-647-2452. Thanks for joining us today on Rural Heritage on RFD TV, where we bring you stories of people borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information, or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.